thank you, Jeremy, and, and for Maureen, uh, those who have filled in all of this time for uh, Kid Sermon. Uh, I am so proud of both of you. Jeremy, I, you know, you are, I, for, for one, it's going to be hard for me to think of you without Wooly uh, from now on, but, uh, but uh, we were backstage right before, and uh, Jeremy realized for the first time that Wooly made a noise. Can I hear the noise, Jeremy? Would you hear? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Jer so he was trying to be secretive about it and putting, a, putting it in his, and so he was struggling with the noise. But I have appreciated both of your creativity every week. You guys don't maybe know it, but they're both studying for ministry, and uh, we have multiple ministerial candidates in our church, some of whom are very close to being uh, ordained. In fact, our own pastor, JC, is going to be ordained in April uh, in the Church of the Nazarene. That's going to happen... Uh, probably going to happen somehow online, but we're pretty excited about uh, that happening. And so, proud of you. There's a few more that are doing it. We'll try to introduce you along the way uh, to them and uh, give them some chances uh, to minister. So I really appreciate both of you. And I have my, my uh, at Christmas. I was thinking about people that made church possible this year in a unique year. And uh, Jeremy, you know, as somebody that's not employed by the church, you were right up at the top of the list, man. And Misty, I've been faithful uh, back in Kids Zone for since how long has it been going on? A year. Uh, it's just been amazing, and I've been so blessed to call uh, you guys partners in ministry. So thank you. Um, real quickly, uh, tomorrow night we are having a membership information class. I, we call it Connections. Uh, going to it does not obligate you to be a member. Uh, what it does do is let you come on and ask some questions and hear some things about our church. If you desire to join after that class, you're, you're welcome to. But that's going to take place tomorrow at 6, and we have multiple people signed up for that class. Uh, if you're interested, would you reach out to me or to the church office tomorrow, and I will send you, it's, a, it's an online class, I'll send you the Zoom link, and we'll send you uh, the little syllabus thing, and you can join us uh, tomorrow night if you want, 6. It's a one-time only class, so you're not committing for five weeks or something like that. We will just get it all uh, in tomorrow night. And uh, it's just a good chance for you to ask questions and figure out a little bit about who we are. And uh, I'll be on that. And uh, so like I said, if, if you don't have my contact information, contact uh, the church office tomorrow. They'll put you in contact with me. You can message me through Facebook. There's all sorts of ways you can get. You can come talk to me after the service today if you want to be a part of that. And also, we have multiple people now wanting to be baptized. And we're working on some things to make that happen here, probably in the month of February. If you are interested in being baptized, we want to hear from you. So just reach out uh, if you are a teen and have never been baptized, if you are a child, a parent of a child, and, and you've been talking to them about it, this is a great chance. And so uh, let us know, because we, uh, we would love, oh, you know what, we need some celebrations, don't we? And I can't think of a bigger celebration in the Church of God than baptisms. And uh, so uh, let me know about that. Well, let's jump into our sermon this morning. Uh, I want to show you a picture here. I learned about this person recently. I've never heard of her before. Uh, her name is Nian Chang. And uh, during the Chinese uh, uh, Revolution, uh, the Chinese communists imprisoned her uh, for, excuse me, during the Cultural Revolution for six years. Uh, educated in the West, she had become a Christian. And so the Chinese communists are holding her in prison. And in her book, Life and Death in Shanghai, Yen gives this harrowing yet inspiring account of what happened during one assault by the Red Guard. She wrote this. I was silently reciting to myself the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The man with the tinted spectacles and the man from the police department were looking at me thoughtfully. They mistook my silence for weakening. I knew I had to show courage. In fact, I felt much better for having recited the words of the psalm. I had not been so free of fear the whole evening as I was in that moment, standing beside the black jeep, a symbol of repression. I lifted my head and said in a loud and firm voice, I am not guilty. I have nothing to confess. It's interesting to me how important the words of the psalm we're looking at were to her. 
in bringing peace to her. And I really want the words of that psalm to become deeply ingrained in our lives uh, because I think in a time such as this one, tethering and connecting deeply to the Word of God is so vital to who we are as a people. And I can't think of a better psalm in the storm than Psalm 23. It's almost like this, this peaceful, restful oasis. Today we're in the second part of the 23rd Psalm, the second part of our series on the 23rd Psalm. And I, we're going to recite that Psalm again, and I would like us all to stand. Alex Rieg is going to come this morning, and he's going to be reading once again the entire 23rd Psalm. I know you've heard it several times this morning, but I want you to pay special attention to the words as they're being read and to consider what God is communicating. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, the go surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you for me. As you know, it's important to us. Uh, we consider ourselves a, an intergenerational church, and having folks like Sherry Reed and uh, having Alex Reed this morning uh, is uh, uh, important to us to, to be giving different opportunities for leadership for different people at different age groups in our church. So last week we talked about this good shepherd. We're going to talk a little bit more about that this morning. This shepherd who is trying to lead us back, trying to restore us to the state we were created to be. He restores our soul. This week we're going to go farther into some of the more challenging parts of the psalm. Uh, there's some part of, parts of the psalm that are, I believe, intentionally designed to, to provoke us a little bit, to think. Uh, so let's talk again and let's, let's consider this good shepherd a little bit more this morning. First off, this good shepherd is a shepherd who has a distinctive plan. Uh, he is a shepherd who is leading us in a certain direction intentionally, okay? The psalm at its core is not about our peace, okay? The psalm at its core is about him, right? It is about him leading us. And when that happens, then we find our peace. He is our leader. Now let me ask you something. What are some places we look to in our society or maybe in our personal life for leadership? Where do we look for leadership in this day and age? I'm throwing, I'm going to be, I'm going to ask a few questions this morning. Vicki? The church. The church. We look to the church for leadership. Others? Our parents. Our parents. Our pastor. Our pastor. Good luck with that one. Uh, yeah. Our employers, those in leadership in, in where we work, our vocation, others? <laughs> How's that going? Uh, my wife is what he said. Yes, I do the same thing. So are there others? Teachers. Teachers. You know, it's just interesting to me. We're about seven or eight in. Nobody has said our politicians. Interesting. And that's probably okay right now. <laughs> Um, although we're supposed to have respect for those in authority. But I think there is a, a leadership vacuum right now. If we're going to know the peace that, that comes from living out these words of Davis, David, uh, we first have to settle this leadership question. I, I played on this a little bit last week. There is no peace for us unless we settle the issue of lordship in our life. Okay. No peace for us unless we settle the issue of lordship. In other words, unless we have decided who our shepherd is, we're not going to know peace. And I would say it's possible to decide who our shepherd is and still not know peace when we pick the wrong shepherd, okay? When we know the wrong shepherd. So it's imperative that we pick the right shepherd. 
As to lordship, the psalm here actually goes a little bit further. It says this. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What's that mean? He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Well, his name is, is, is the embodiment of perfection, of power, of holiness. He is leading us in paths of righteousness for the right reason, for perfected reasons, paths of righteousness. Perhaps the central characteristic of, of those people in my life, think of the people in your life that know peace, that you consider to be people who are experiencing a deep level of peace and know peace uh, in, in unique ways. The people you sort of look to during the storm. One of the things I've learned about folks that lead peaceful lives is the fact that they're people who typically choose good paths. Okay? People who know peace typically select good paths. I've seen it repeated over and over again throughout my life. Uh, they're the people I tend to try to emulate. Now, choosing paths is interesting. Uh, Anita and I my wife, since we have several, quite a few new people in here this morning, and Nina uh, and my wife, uh, my wife and I, uh, when we are traveling, always choose different paths. Um, she chooses her path, and I understand that I choose the wrong path. That's what I've been, <laughs> that's what I've been told on several occasions. We'll go home entirely separate ways. We live in the same place, we depart from the same location, we go two separate routes. Uh, in our society, when we're choosing pathways, both literally when we're, say, driving uh, uh, to a destination, but also in terms of spiritually and in, in, in terms of the direction of our lives, in our culture, we often choose paths for several reasons. One of the reasons we will choose a path is because it is quick, it's expedient, it's the shortcut, right? Now, another reason we will choose a path is because it is comfortable. We know it. It's familiar. Now, I would propose to us this morning that those are two reasons that can be okay reasons, but they might not always be the best reason. In other words, speed or expedience or comfort, choosing paths based on that might not be always consistently the best route when we're deciding how to live our lives, okay? Now, I like shortcuts. I prefer level paths. If you know me, I don't like to walk uphill um, uh, for a variety of reasons. But I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I am somebody who, in terms of, you know, navigating a pathway, tends to take the easy path. But the easy paths are not always the best paths. Difficult paths or less obvious paths, you know, in terms of life decisions, are oftentimes the better paths. You know, in my own life, I chose to go into ministry. I, I don't say that to brag. I just say that it did create problems for me. And I was not naive when I went into ministry. I knew that this was kind of choosing to live a different way. You know, I, I look, we chose to become foster parents. Uh, there are all sorts of times in our life where you've decided to do things because they were right, but they were not necessarily easy. And I would argue the path of righteousness, or even more specifically, the path of salvation, is not always easy. Matthew 7, in verses 13 and 14, Jesus, uh, these are his own words about life and, and how we're going to navigate it. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only few find it. The narrow road is oftentimes the more difficult road. And the difficult road is oftentimes the road prescribed for us by Jesus. As Christians, we have this leader. This path he leads us on is going to face challenges. Jesus himself said, We've talked about this multiple times over the last year. In this world, you'll have troubles. In this world, you're going to have troubles. He even goes on on multiple occasions. He says, if you follow me, you're going to have troubles because you're following me. 
That's why I reject this nutty prosperity theology that says when you come to Jesus, life's going to get easy and you're going to get wealthy and healthy. Now, Jesus pretty much says, if you follow me, people are going to be against you because people are against me. But the hard way that's led by Jesus is always, 100% of the time, without exception, the right way. And I would argue it is the good way. And I would argue it's the more important way right now. Okay? What do I mean by that? The world right now seems a little unhinged, right? I mean, anybody disagree with me on that? The world's problematic right now. And what we need right now is a church that looks like Jesus. By the way, a church that looks like Jesus is going to face problems from all sides, left and right. Because we stand in opposition to sort of the power structures of the world. We need to be a people who look different. And, and Psalm 23 gives us a little insight into how we can look different by submitting to the leadership of a shepherd. What it requires is, is uh, self-critique and repentance. We need to uh, kind of look at life and, and, and change uh, how we do life from time to time. Okay? Um, Billy Graham once said this. I thought this was pretty obvious, but sometimes we need to hear the obvious. To find the right path, we need to first remember why we're on the wrong path. The reason can be put in one word. Sin. Okay? So one of the things we need to... What are some wrong paths right now that the world chooses? Or maybe that we've chosen from time to time. Yeah. Social media. <laughs> social media. And not all social media is bad, but you'll see social media become a place of, of hatred. And I would argue that hatred always stands in opposition to the gospel. It is okay to hate sinful things. It is not okay to hate people. Does that make sense? What are some other things that the, that the world does right now that, that maybe some wrong paths? Prosperity. Prosperity. Others? Greed, gossip, fame can be dangerous and toxic, power. You know, Jesus said, it, you know, basically in a nutshell, if you want to be first, you have to be last first. Does that make sense? And so the way of the cross, this, is always different than the way of the world. So we need to be looking for a different way of living. Now, uh, moving on to our next point here. Uh, our shepherd is more powerful than death itself. Okay? The shepherd destroys death. The shepherd levels death. A and because of that, we need not fear. This year has driven that point home to me perhaps more than any other year. Uh, it's a reminder that, you know, there's been some good parts of this year. One of the great parts of this year is a reminder that I'm not in control. But God is still working, and he's asking me to join him in that work. Thinking back to that author, Nian Chang, that I shared at the beginning, I love what she said. She said she felt much better for having recited the words of the psalm. Standing in front of men who intended to do her harm, she said... She had not been free of fear, so free of fear the whole evening as she was in that moment. Fear was leveled. Fear was destroyed. Fear was flattened. Chang encountered a principle that would change her forever. Realizing God was with her diminished or even eliminated fear. You know, it's sort of fun. Do you remember? Remember when you were little? When I was little, I had a horrible habit. You know what I would do? When I was at a store, like we'd always go to Sears. Remember when Sears existed? Uh, we would go to Sears. And, and I remember at Sears, they had the circular clothing racks, right? Anybody remember the circular clothing racks at Sears? So I'm like five, okay? And I was kind of problematic at five, right? Uh, and at five, you're starting to let your wings spread a little bit, and you, see, you think you know how the world works. And I remember as a five-year-old at Sears in Redmond with my mom and dad, I would step into the center of the circular clothing rack, into my own little world. 
you know, my own little Narnia, uh, that I had all sorts of control over. And then I would step out of that after a few minutes in there. And you know what had happened in those minutes that I'd been in there? My mom and dad were gone. <laughs> yeah, and I know what my mom, having now been a parent, I know what were my mom and dad doing? They were frantically looking for me. They were the shepherd. They were, they were looking for the lost sheep. And I remember stepping out thinking I knew, you know, how I wanted to live. I stepped out and stepped in uh, uh, to a world where I now lacked the leadership of my parents. And there was only one thing that was going to bring me comfort. What was that one thing? Them finding me, my parents. And that's what we do here. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. A couple different translations. I did this last week as well. We're familiar with the valley of the shadow of death. Another translation says the darkest valley. Even though you're in the darkest valley. Uh, one, pa one, one translation says death valley. You're in death valley. We've all been there. The thing we thought would never happen, happened. The shoe dropped. Disaster struck. The diagnosis came back. The pink slip was issued. The spouse left. The child passed away. And we are broken. Some never escape that place. That's where they spend the remainder of their life. But others find something in that dark moment. Maybe some of you re realize this or have known this moment in your own life. That we're, we're going about life sort of organizing and, and working through circumstances and improving our lot and then all of a sudden that's just snatched away from us and all of a sudden we realize that we're standing there somewhat alone but we maybe for the first time in our life realize that we're not alone that God is with us and we also realize this other thing we have no control but that's okay we're sort of inundated. Some of us he will, will even realize, perhaps for the first time in our life, God is with me. God is with us. And we are forever changed. Death Valley, when approached properly, can, can change us. I have asked a friend of mine who, if you've, if you've been to this church for a long time, you've seen this guy go from, from here to here. Okay? He's an adult. He's a parent in our church now has some beautiful children and a wife, beautiful wife and great family. Uh, I want to, Ryan Portinger to come up here. Ryan's going to, Ryan has been on a journey in the last couple years that most people are unaware of. And uh, he wanted to tell a little bit of that story. Ryan and I are in a men's small group together. And he shared this story and it was right as I was preparing the sermon. I said, you got to tell this. You got to say what's going on. So uh, Ryan, I'm going to have you step over here so the camera can see you. And uh, would you uh, welcome Ryan with me this morning? Thank you, Pastor Mike. Good morning. Um, so I got an introduction. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I have been through some things over the last two years, and I wanted to share with you guys. And this is very fitting, and that's why you've invited me. <laughs> um, so I, I didn't know exactly how to approach it, so I kind of want to read what I wrote down. Um, so kind of beginning in late 2018, I started having some pretty significant symptoms in my left hand and my left foot, and I'd be walking, you know, I'd work over at the college, and I'd park about a quarter mile away, and I'd start walking up to the campus, and I'd have a limp, and I'd wonder, oh, what's going on? There's something going on, and I kind of let it go, and I tried to deal with it on my own, and not, I didn't even tell my wife, because I thought, honestly, I thought, it's probably my, a pinched nerve. I've, I have two herniated discs, so I thought it's probably something like that. Maybe I should go to the chiropractor. But I don't really like going to the chiropractor, so I just dealt with it uh, on my own and didn't say anything. So early 2019, I had, I had gone to the chiropractor because it wasn't going away, and I exhausted my insurance, and both the chiropractor and I agreed there's something more because this hand and this uh, leg thing were not going away. And so we thought, oh, maybe it's neurological. Maybe I'll schedule something with the doctor. So I go to the doctor, and um, the doctor was concerned after doing several tests, you know, some resistance tests and things like that, and 
didn't seem like a muscle thing. So she said she really wanted me to do an EKG on my heart and brain scan and all this kind of stuff. And I kind of was going, oh, man, this seems bigger. And I was a little getting a little concerned at that point. And she, th these, I'll never forget these words. She said, best case, Ryan, this is a brain tumor. And I was like, a brain tumor? <laughs> so this is where it gets emotional for me. Um, at that point, I thought, mm. this is where I just need to rely on God. And it's like everything sl slowed down in my life. And I got a glimpse of what it feels like to be extremely patient with my children, to love my wife like I never loved her before. And it was, it was truly that moment where it felt, it felt not like I was potentially going to die, but it felt like um, God was taking care of me and making me slow down. And so, I'm sorry. So, the idea that I had a brain tumor and that I might, I mean, uh, she said best case, so I had to think, okay, that means it's operable. That means it's not a terminal thing. And I thought, okay, well, that means there's, there's potentially more life to be lived. Uh, i got to do this the best that I can. I, I, this is... This is just the way we live. We try to take care of our families, right? So I got life insurance, and, and, but I still had this thing looming. And this is only like a two-week period because she was like, I don't think it's going to be cancerous, but we do need to get our MRI going quickly. So um, I, I did feel this peace. I felt that God was taking care of me no matter what was going to happen. And there was this moment I came in one Sunday, and I, I remember walking in. The reason I get emotional about this, guys, is because I've never really felt a love like what I was feeling in that moment. And it's a type of thing that you would expect to be very, very concerned about. So I walked in one Sunday, and I was out here by the coffee area, the, in the little foyer area, and I felt this immense... Um, overwhelming sense of love. Um, almost like, it's gonna, this is going to sound a little weird, weird, but almost like a sorrow and a sadness that I, I hadn't done as well as I could have in loving and following that, that narrow path that God wants us to be on and he's constantly try, trying to guide us toward. But I was so thankful, and I am so thankful so I have, to, I have to kind of tell you the rest of the story real quick. So no brain tumor. <laughs> um, what ended up happening, so that was best case. Remember, what ended up happening is I go back in, and I get diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So, so that was early 2019, May-ish. Veronica knows the exact date, my wife. <laughs> um, so she's really good with knowing the exact moment, the exact date. But I started journaling. The journey for me has been more of a reliance on God, um, and it, and um, Jeremy said this morning with with Wooly with Lammy, I would say my kids have lambs. Um, that sometimes God says no. Sometimes He makes us go through things like this. So the whole time being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, I haven't reached out a lot. I haven't asked for prayer. So I'm asking for prayer. But I'm also letting you guys know that my testimony in this is that I'm so thankful that I have this diagnosis and that I got to have a little glimpse of even the prior potential diagnosis with a tumor because that moment out here where I felt that love and I wrote down in here that there were there's a very, very distinct moment where I remember being so patient with my kids and I'm not super patient. You guys might see me sometimes and think Ryan's patient, but I have like this internal like expectation of how things are supposed to go, and it causes me to be impatient sometimes. So anyway, I w I'm so thankful um, that I've gone through this, that I'm going through this, and I'm just, I said in our men's um, 
Bible study the other night that I, I welcome whatever God has for me, I, whether it's bad or good, because I know it's in my best interest. So that's what wow. I got. <laughs> Thank you so much. We put it on the Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, that's an amazing story. Ed, Anita, you did something right. Look at that. What a kid. Adult. Um, but as you were hearing you, some of you have gotten that diagnosis before, right? The, the difficult diagnosis. Some of you had no idea what was going on in Ryan's life, but Ryan was getting um, a strange blessing. For a moment, he got to see God in control of his life where he couldn't control anything, and it was okay. It was all right. Reminds me of the verse we studied when the whole pandemic started, a verse that should be incredibly familiar to all of you right now, Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing. God is working through the course of human history. He is working through the stories of your life to make all things new, to restore you to fullness. We will not know it fully on this side of glory, but we can know the peace right now. We can know the peace right now. Because you see, the shepherd provides comfort. And that's our final point today. And it happens kind of in the, the most unusual way. He says, the psalmist says, David says, your rod and staff, they come for me. The rod uh, was likely used in a protective sense. It would have been a shorter, stubbier, club-like device. So imagine for a second you're a, a sheep by a stream. A lot of times sheep are remarkably unaware of the dangers that surround them. Yet God and his providence knows and is working to protect us from harm. A lot of times we think, well, I don't, I don't know if that's, I don't see that going on. Well, you don't see it because you're unaware of it because God has protected you from something that didn't happen. Think about that for a second. He watches over us. I think of Nian Cheng again, the story we read this morning. I think of another psalm, Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountain. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He'll not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Think about that for a second. There's six or seven or eight hours a day where I have no control over what's going on. I'm sound asleep, but God is, doesn't sleep. God is watching me then. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going both now and forevermore. So he has this rod that is protecting us from external threats, but he also has the staff. We all know what the staff sort of looks like. It's more of a tool of guidance. It's a tool of leading. So some of you have heard the, the old saying, by hook or by crook, right? Well, that refers to the staff, that uh, God uses that to, 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 to move us around. Sometimes it's uh, uh, in the form of, of discipline. God makes us move through circumstance. Sometimes he speaks to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes he speaks to us through wise counsel. But God is always working to steer us in his direction. Sometimes it's hard, by the way. Hebrews 12, uh, starting the second half of verse 5, says this. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord nor be weary when reproved by him. You know, discipline's a funny thing. We, we don't like it, do we? If we're parents, we've had to exercise discipline with our children. But when it happens to us, it's a bit harder. But verse 6 reminds us, the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. God 
isn't about making us feel good. He's about, and it takes us back to the beginning of this psalm again, right? Leading us in paths of righteousness. And when he leads us in paths of righteousness, we are on a path that is beneficial for us, even if in the moment it doesn't feel like it. Right? God is working. One of the things I like most about Psalm 23 as we sort of wrap things up this morning is its honesty. So many of us live under the illusion that finding peace is just about escaping hard times. Getting out of the hard times. But if you've lived any number of years now, you've probably realized that getting out of hard times isn't always possible. Psalm 23 shows us that God is leading us into peace even though threats may surround us. He takes us through Death Valley. And with a rod and a staff, he guides us and protects us and disciplines us. And we can find comfort because we follow the good shepherd. Are you scared? Are you worried? Tune down the noise of the world. It's okay to watch a little news. In fact, it's probably important to watch a little news. If it's consuming you, it's probably become idolatrous. And when you're in those moments of wanting to shake your fist at the world, turn to Jesus. Turn to God. Turn to the good shepherd. Seek out his character and seek out his promises and watch how he's working in your life. Pay special attention to the times when he's come in and rescued and saved you and protected you from harm. The famous author, Robert Louis Stevenson, tells a story of a, uh, a transport vessel that gets caught off a rocky coast in a, in a horrible storm. And the storm is threatening to drive the ship and its passengers into the rocks and into destruction. And in the, the midst of the storm, a, a daring man, contrary to orders, goes up onto the deck. And then he makes a dangerous pathway to the wheelhouse, to the pilot house. And he catches eyes with the, the man steering the vessel, the steerman. The man is at his post holding the wheel and without wavering inch by inch, turning the ship out once more to sea, guiding it away from the rocks, even though the storm is powerful. The pilot sees the man staring at him. And he smiles. And then that daring man who made his way to the pilot house makes his way back to the rest of the passengers below. And he says this. I've seen the face of the pilot. And he smiled. All is well. Well, we're in a storm right now. And all around us we have voices of chaos. Voices of destruction. Voices who yell fear. When all the while we serve a pilot, a shepherd, who looks at us and says, peace be still. I'm with you. I'm always with you. Let's stand as we close with the Lord's Prayer this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.